how's everyone? Hi, Ryan. Thanks everybody for being here. Good morning uh, and welcome to Coffee Chats. My name is Jordan Gentry Nelson and I am the Director of Programming here at Big Medium. If you're not familiar with Coffee Chats, which many of you here are, uh, it's a part of our Creative Standard Programming, which aims to fortify, promote uh, the professional, creative, and economic success of local artists. And this morning, we're really grateful to have Ryan Rancy here with us. And uh, Ryan, if you could start by just telling us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, well, hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Rancy. I'm a local studio artist, muralist, and educator here. Um, I've been doing art all my life. It's just been something naturally baked into uh, my habits. Um, but for a long time, I knew I was going to be in the field of art, uh, whether that was architecture, design, uh, painting, I always felt this calling. So here I am today, able to kind of lead this little career. And hopefully I can share some advice or just a cool story for you. Yeah, so let's start from like the beginning, just a background on like um, more of your personal life, I guess. Yeah, so I grew up Tomball, Texas, Northwest Houston, um, for most that might know that area. Um, it's interesting being next to such a multicultural city, but growing up in quite a, a, a city with a lack of diversity. Um, so you kind of see a lot of different angles there. Um, my parents, Houston, right? Yes, yes, in Houston, first Tomball. Um, yeah. My parents and grandparents being Jamaican, um, me being first generation American, as well as all of my siblings, we kind of got this very uh, different experience being in the home versus being in public. they just like standardized cultures and different uh, work ethics or standards that were expected of you. Um, so it was really interesting growing up in that sense of diversity. Um, and it definitely plays now heavily into my art in a way that I didn't think it ever would. Yeah, um, how did, like, you talk about that there's this immigrant mentality that was sort of passed down uh, from your parents and that that really affected, like, the standards and work ethic that you have now. Um, you talk about the, the word overachiever. Can you right. talk about that? Yeah, so for me growing up, my parents always really pushed us to take the hardest classes. Just excelling is a matter of trying and trying and seeking out whatever opportunities come from that. Um, and so when it comes to studying and taking tests, you know, you have a grade scale where you're trying to reach 100. And when you do hit 100, your classmates may call you an overachiever. But to me, you're just hitting standard achievement by answering everything correctly that you were just taught. So it's like this different standard of what is a general baseline of acceptance might have been higher in some areas, but you know, you think about things like equality and how people might use their their sense of equality or love for others as like a stamp to to say they're better than others. Somehow they're using equality as a point of superiority again. And so in my work and in my standards of just all of us relating to one, of an, one another, it shouldn't feel like a utopian idea. It really should just be a, a general understanding that we can all work towards. Um, so I feel like that's, that's kind of what has been built out of what my parents taught me through that immigrant mindset of, if you're not more than you're, you can't be equal to. Yeah. So. And I, I see that that is translated through your work. Um, can you talk more about, well, you said that you've never taken a painting class through high school or college. So I think that the way that your work ethic, you, you found out, you knew from a young age that you wanted to be an artist and you pursued that outside of like traditional means. Um, can you talk more about how, um, you developed your painting practice? Yeah, so I always thought art was interesting in the terms of you define your style, you can try other people's style, 
and kind of build your own voice. And so to me, after years of just learning throughout um, grade school and high school, I had this idea that if I could learn as many other styles as possible and like have a good understanding of what the masters were doing to create their works, then eventually some kind of style would form out of that. And it was kind of like a style blending of sorts. So it's hard to pinpoint my style at times. Um, but having this natural, like, autodidactic need to go and find stuff out is probably what pulled me to always be making art outside of school because I went to Texas State um, for communication design, my design degree, and a lot of artists would only do their schoolwork and they didn't know why they weren't excelling or like attaining their own goals and dreams. And it's hard to remember that the schoolwork is just the foundation for your practice. You know, you realize you can't even start talking about freelancing and becoming entrepreneurial if you haven't got the rigorous day-to-day -day work done yet, right? So I kind of realized that's why that's not talked about in schools. But um, for me, there were painting classes at Texas State and definitely nothing against Texas State. It's just a point of reference. Um, but, you know, you learn five different methods or five different paintings per semester. Most artists wouldn't even finish their five paintings. So the idea of having a career off of 10 unfinished paintings a year, it just didn't sit well for me. And so I kind of had to push myself past that um, to seek out whatever it was that I was trying to pull from art, but I didn't want to get locked into a specific mentality, especially when it comes to something so creative. Um, so yeah, I just tried to flee that. Yeah, I think that still goes back to you going above and beyond and that you were really thinking about the future and you're already thinking about uh, your art in terms of a career and not just like that you're just really strategic about that. Yeah. Um, and that two wasn't enough and that you had to <laughs> do more. Um, and there's this story that you told that, so you're making all this work outside of like the parameters of, of like the school, um, mm -hmm. but you sought out a professor to look at your work. Yeah. And I, I want to hear about like how mentorship has played into your success. Yeah, so interestingly enough, many of my professors um, were mentors throughout that period and after. A lot of what people forget about the value of school is are the people you meet and what they can instill within you and hopefully help you with after. Um, so you just being very involved and very interested kind of helps bring mentorship to you. Um, our history professor, he was really into like Roman gladiators and graffiti and he used to skateboard. So I ended up redesigning and painting his 1986 Paul Peralta skateboard. Um, and he left the final to go skate outside with me while students were still taking the test just because of this like ingrained connection of like being deeply enrooted to what we loved and still finding like a modern connection um, that has just spurred like different things that I would have never learned about art history that aren't necessarily in the Western art history lesson plan that he's been able to open me up to, which has effectively changed my work. Um, like we were saying with the paintings, I would take a small set of paintings, whether they were my skyscapes or my portraits um, very early on to Tommy Fitzpatrick at um, Texas State and I'd get his feedback on, you know, where are my paintings? Do they feel unified? Is there like a, a nice voice behind them? Does it make sense? And, you know, he would encourage me. He wouldn't necessarily say like, continue this or take this out of it, right? Because art is so fluid and it really is a conversation. But he'd always tell me different artists to look at. And he would ask um, if I was gonna get my MFA and so for me, I told him, 
it was best to take a five year, um, not hiatus, but take a five year period working in my career, seeing if I really wanted to be in the art field, if I'd rather be in a firm position doing design work. Now you can't really tell how to best apply school until you're in the real world. So I guess I'm on year four now. I graduated 2016. So it's still a debate. I might go back and consider an MFA next year. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, I'm happy with what I've been able to build and the connections I've been able to make. And it was always interesting because I realized when you're in school or you're in that incubator, like a workshop, you feel all this energy and some of your ideas, they're really not new. You had them before, you just didn't have other people like encouraging you to put something down on the paper. Mm -hmm. So I asked myself, what would it be like to put yourself through a master's program? Like, you know how a teacher would push you. You know when you'd be lazy. You know what a deadline does to you. Like, you know when you're timid to put the right finances behind a project. I think I've heard every art student over the history of time complain about how much they spent on the materials, right? Mm -hmm. But when you have a finished product, when you're able to take those lesser materials and make something more grand, it makes sense. And once you build that practice, then it becomes more feasible. Yeah, and I, again, I, I appreciate how you've like created that structure for yourself and have pushed yourself. Um, I wanna hear, so you're also, so that talks about like your studio practice and how it's evolved. You're also mm -hmm. a muralist and that sort of came out, you're talking about the skateboard, um, yeah, so, how that happened. Yeah, yeah so again, at Texas State, um, just by chance, I was walking through the halls, looking at different paintings of fellow classmates and I came across this really large painting, red and black painting, and I sat down next to somebody that was looking at it. So I sat down on my skateboard, because that's how I traveled around the campus, mm -hmm. um, and marketed my skateboard company at the same time. And I sat there and they asked me what I thought about the painting. And for some reason, I actually like, really sat there and thought about it. And then after a few moments, I told them what I thought. And then we started talking um, just in general, and I found out those were his artworks on the wall. So I didn't know that <laughs> I was about to critique their personal artworks that could have gone really bad. Um, but fortunately, it spurred into a mentorship where they had a mural project underway that they needed assistance on. Um, of course, I didn't care to be paid. I just wanted to know how you get into murals and you know, what's the safest and most efficient way to do it without spray can. Um, still to this day, I don't like spray can. It's just a preference thing. Um, mm -hmm. Access to colors, you know. Yeah. Um, but for him, he wanted to work with carbon fiber. His name is Jorge Palomares. Uh, he wanted to work with carbon fiber and make new sculptural products um, and different um, castings. So I was using carbon fiber and different composites to build skateboards and longboards. Um, I would hollow out the skateboards and fill it with um, pourable foam so that you take away the weight of the wood and then you put carbon fiber over it to reinforce it and add all the structural strength back into it without the weight. So it's different things for people racing, et cetera, but just our cross application of each other's mutual skills ended up blossoming into just two more creative individuals, All right? The, it was cool that we never like tore down from each other or tried to beat the other to like some kind of level of success. Yeah. It's been really nice. Yeah, that's awesome that you're so open again to collaboration and new ideas and just like trying to educate yourself with a lot of different materials that things kind of naturally come together. Can you talk about um, why murals are especially important to you and like how you can use them differently than your paintings? Yeah, so with my private work and my studio work, there's sometimes I never show a painting to anyone. 
um, the client it just goes straight to them and it lives in their home, which is more than fine with me. I respect that as I have art the same way. Um, but for a public work, something on display, usually for a longer period of time as well, um, you get a chance to kind of leave little tidbits or ideas for uh, the youth and the older generations to kind of connect with. You're almost like planting seeds um, for a community. <clears throat> so you can use your message positively or for fun, you know, even just beautifying areas. Um, that has a lot of good return just through the community. And so I've always loved to use art as like a wayfinder, as like a point where kids can meet up. You know, I love that idea. They're just like, I'll meet you at uh, this mural, like, you know, and just you become part of their surroundings. You become something that is like a standing post in their mind, in their community. And so just being able to use art on that level before you even get to the content and the context that you can address um, just by having a specific artwork displayed a certain way in a community. Like there's so many ways you can address topics through environmental design, as well as imagery being large and on a wall. So I like that, that tenuous play you get. Can you describe um, a mural project that was really significant for you? Yeah, so actually uh, Woldridge Elementary, this was last year in the fall. They wanted a mural on the outside of their building of the school um, to try and pull all of the different refugees um, that have recently been moved to that area because it was a lower income housing district. And so it was just easier to move refugees into that space. So there were so many international families in that area that we decided to make the, um, and I think I sent that one to you, yeah, um, decided to cool. use their quail, their mascot, and put them in the center like a little field. And all of the words that you see on the background are students' names, faculty names, family members' names, and where they're from. So it shows this great sense of diversity. So as you go up close, you can read all the different names and all the people that make up the community. But as you back away from it, you see the unified image of the quail um, in the landscape. So, yeah. so it's like this cool, um, this cool way of getting the community involved mm -hmm. to where they're having their input, both literally and just um, seeing, seeing how they can be part of building a message as children, right? Yeah, and um, you, so there is a community aspect to your work that's important and you have been mentored uh, outside of just art that you've had people guiding you and how you can use your voice in the community to also have an impact. Definitely. So um, 2014, I believe I met Clifford Gilliard um, and he is the president of Capital View Arts, which I'll shortly be a board member of. And so to have this, thank you, full circle, like experience of being helped by a nonprofit as an underserved minority artist, um, you know, working in Austin, to now being able to look back and help those that really didn't have um, or don't have the same understandings that I do now. And so essentially um, through community organization events, through art events that they sponsored through different grant writing that I've been taught different ways to seek out financial uh, support, whether that is um, for work or funding, et cetera. It's like having this full understanding that the political system is just as involved and necessary to art development as going and practicing. So, you know, you can't, you can't completely blame one side without understanding like how they come together. Because a lot of people put pressure on 
um, nonprofits and city entities to do the work, but a lot of people aren't reaching out to them and letting them know what work needs to be done and the best way that they can be met in the middle. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I feel like a lot of nonprofits often fly blind and they're seeking out ways they can help, but no one is really contacting them, letting them know like the best ways to engage in their community and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So yeah, your work talks a lot about togetherness. Uh, can you speak more about like the message behind your paintings? Yeah. So like I was saying, being from a predominantly Jamaican family, there's just so many different cultures and ethnicities that move through that area that your family, it's like a global image of races. So that's the way I was growing up. Every family event was just a house full of different colored people. You know, and the way I approached people, I always had this like, nuanced middle ground where I could kind of speak to people on either side but in certain cities I didn't connect with anyone right because I was I was so different and able to blend in that I was also like the I was also had a, a target on me it was like so for example um, black people may call me white Ryan or white people may call me black Ryan as this way to categorize where I should fit in their mind of like, like you're crossing too many things. So let me try and like mentally bring it back down. Mm -hmm. um, so what my work does is uses color and this vivacious sense of colors that you can't naturally find to push away skin tone. So once you are involved in the personality and the psychosis that you see in the painting, you know, it's almost too late. Like there's no going back. Once you've like fallen in love with those colors and fallen in love with the humanity of the image that you're seeing, it's hard to unsee that. And so I feel like that's kind of the work that I'm doing is creating a universal connection to where any race can look at it and see humanity. Mm -hmm. So focusing on uh, social and racial reconciliation is at the end of the day my goal. But again, it, I don't think it should be seen as utopian. I think it's a pretty standard, like standard goal, yeah. yeah. Simple thing to ask for. Yeah, and I, but I do like that you're acknowledging that we, a lot of people have these biases, well, we all have our own biases, mm -hmm. um, one way or the other, and that you're trying to like sidestep that in people's minds, that you can just look at it and look through to humanity. Yep, I definitely. And so um, on that point, I've started to add more symbolism into the work, whether that's using fluorescent, phosphorescent, iridescent, color thermochromic pigments to shift the work even further. You know, some of them glow in the dark, just giving you this experience with your painting where your painting <clears throat> is constantly changing and breathing the same way you are. Um, you know, there's studies that show we as people change every 10 years, like your habits become more rooted in you. Um, even every seven years, your palate changes. Well, our so, cells change. Every seven years, yeah. our cells like, are different. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. so having this constant uh, revamping of mindset to kind of come alive through the painting where you're painting with, you know, yellow to red, you mix those and you get orange, but the idea of mixing yellow to blue and green to purple, you get this whole new like chemistry and color theory that you have to work with and find a, the best way to apply it contextually to the work so that it still really does, you know, answer the same questions and it's not just like fun art again. Yeah, I like that you've like retained this like recognizable style with the colorful palette, but you're pushing it by using new materials. Um, I would you be able to show us some of the like phosphorescent type paints or like show yeah, us? Okay. I don't know. I'm gonna put you on the spot. But. It's okay. It's okay. I can <laughs> find something. I just think that's really interesting.
we're going to have a little show and tell. That's great. All right. So the one that I'm going to show you is called The Grass is Greener on This Side. OK? <laughs> so this is a bedroom that you've made your studio, right, Ryan? Yeah, so this is my uh, uh, studio space. In your home. Yep, because we've had a lot of con conflicts of what is better, a studio or a home studio. For me, I wake up at 2 a.m., so I'd rather paint any time of the day. Wait, what? Yeah. At 2 a.m.? Uh, not on purpose. Okay. Yeah. I, like, a... I wish I had a better sleep patterns. <laughs> it's like, if you're a real overachiever, you just don't sleep ever. You just keep working. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this one. Can everyone see this? Yeah. I mean, Zoom isn't the best medium for yep, you're right. art, but let's see what we can do here. I think it's. I appreciate everyone's support. <laughs> okay, so what's going to happen? You can see the bottom part of this painting right down here. It's called The Grass is Greener because the temperature. So colors will change in the painting. You can see them fade slowly back to red. So it has thermochromic pigment. So the idea is as the painting warms up in the summer, you get to see like a different experience with your painting, kind of a reminder just a reminder, the grass is greener on this side, you know, but just getting to play with different elements like that. Uh, there's a lot of like glow in the dark and um, like little special things when you shine a black light on there, you start to see more stars and parts of the sky. Um, but being able to play with different elements like that has really expanded like the voice that I can have with my work. That was so cool. Thank you. Um, can you talk about other symbolism, like other, uh, like you maybe use flowers in a way? Yeah. So for me, there was a long period where I wanted to address a lot of these topics um, socially, you know, but I didn't want to use blunt symbolism. I didn't want to use symbols that were overcharged, overused, um, misconstrued very easily. And so I wanted a universal symbol similar to the colors um, that was just very hard to pin in a negative uh, light. And I realized flowers, they have such a wide understanding, such a wide history connected to them, different periods, different cultures. Um, and so I'm able to evoke different meanings at different times based on the context of the painting. Um, one of them called Disbelief, you see two figures um, and they're self-portraits. You see two figures catching um, basil flowers and basil leaves. And they're like in disbelief that it's raining these flowers. And the idea behind it is like, the context of them standing there in the rain is that we have this weird sense of disbelief when it starts to rain. You know, you start to get a few hits of rain, you're like, is it raining? Like it's your first time being in the rain. So, but it's so naturalized in our community and our culture to question rain, right? And so using that groundwork and that context, you start to see, um, looking at the history of basil, in Greek mythology, in different dramas that they wrote, they would use it for like hatred or being a traitor. Um, so this sense of distrust was what they used uh, basil to represent. 
And then over time, it's grown to this thing of hope and trust in uh, each other. So having a plant go from distrust to trust and being able to change their way of thinking in the same way a human can go from distrust in someone to having trust and faith in somebody is like, it's a very human experience to, to kind of um, push things away or disregard them or misjudge them before giving them a chance. Mm -hmm. So trying to address all of that just by adding a simple symbol of like flowers into this super wild context. I don't think that that was the one that we saw in the beginning of the slideshow, but there was one with self-portrait with sunflowers. Yeah. Not the sunflower one, but the other. Okay, yeah. Yeah. But I like the, uh, the sunflower one. I'll explain that one too. Just the idea of, it's called awestruck. So the three figures, they don't see each other. They're almost like existing within their own space because they're in such, there's such awe around them of these sunflowers raining down, like glowing in this exacerbated sun glow. You have the fade from like the yellows to the reds to the um, to the purples. So it has this really extreme like contrast that's built. And even in those colors, some of those colors will change with the temperature. So it looks like the sun is rising on the painting as some of the colors start to lighten up. So it's just this general sense of awe where you are kind of stuck in your own like mentality, your own world. So it's usually a very positive reflection. It's like a very momentary thing. Um, because you're using your own figure in a lot of the paintings, um, does that have any meaning for you? It's just like very personal? Um, does you have yourself as a model easily? <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah, I often used myself as a model um, for more um, contorted positions. Um, I didn't like using models and like asking them to do these really uncomfortable things that I thought I wouldn't ask myself to do. Then I realized I would only ask myself to do them um, and I was more honest as the figure than using somebody else. It actually took another artist probably three or four years ago telling me that my self-portraits were much more interesting than my other work. And it was like, that kind of hurts. But at the same time, they wouldn't say that if there wasn't a point to it. And so I really like dug into how can I use my self as the vehicle? Um, that way, after you see yourself enough, it almost becomes like a, a symbol. Like you're, you're kind of detached from your image a little bit, which is helpful. You have to be to do a self-portrait. Uh, yeah, in the beginning, it was super scary. I didn't like it, <laughs> but you learn a lot about yourself. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see, we have a question already. I think we'll get to questions in, in a few. Um, uh, if we can wrap it up just before getting into questions from the audience, uh, mm -hmm. I know that you're an educator as well. Uh, you teach oh. painting, but then you also are now do have art business workshops. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, well for years I taught at Painting with a Twist. I still teach there on the weekends just like keep myself involved with people and it's really interesting what you learn from teaching people that have never painted before. So that keeps me humble as an artist and like understanding the gravity of what we do as well. Um, teaching still life and things like that is very standard, um, but I realized it wasn't like the main thing I wanted to help artists with. Um, so I teach a lot of business finance stuff now, and I teach it usually through um, governments or nonprofits um, hiring me and coming in to do one or two workshops um, and offering it to their community, offering it to their um, database of people. And that way I can teach a wider group of people um, that I know are intrinsically connected, but I just feel there's so many, so many small things that if you let slip through the cracks, 
an art career is not feasible. And so, and we could touch on a few of those real quick. Yeah, what would you, if you had to like sum it up to like the top three things maybe that you would give advice to other artists, what would those be? Yeah, so one big thing to me is what I call MEP or your max earning potential. Um, for some people, it's kind of a confusing idea, but in a general sense, it's your inventory, right? So how many paintings do you have? At what price points? And so if you were asked, I wanna buy everything in your studio right now, do you have a number or at least a close general number of what that value is? Like, do you actually know the value of your, your production rate? Right, so can you actually survive off of the work you have? Do you know if you're able to transition from a part-time artist to a full-time artist? If you sold everything you had, how long would it take you to recoup or make enough work to where you wouldn't go like months without being able to sell anything? Right, so knowing all of these metrics will really help you uh, make that jump. And for me, like I said, I still have a part-time job on the side because it's the Jamaican mindset. You can work, you can make more money, so be it. Um, another big thing to me is the barriers to starting, barriers to creating work. Um, for a lot of people, they don't have so much of a dedicated art space, but if you can carve out a literal two foot by two foot corner you can have a dedicated space that allows you to start immediately. So what I mean by that, I'm gonna take you with me here over to the studio spot. So this is where I normally work from, all right? And so if you have your brushes, paint cup, and paint ready to go, I can be painting in about 15 seconds of entering my space. That removes all barriers of entry. I'm not worrying about getting a snack. I'm not worrying about emails. I'm not worrying about setting up paint, mixing paint. All those many hours and all of that mental strain, that kills that creative push that just told you to go paint. So that's why so many people have this hard time kind of overcoming the initial barriers just to start working, right? Much less finish the piece. So as many of those as you can remove so that when that creativity hits, you can access the tools needed to create the much, much um, easier chance of actually creating stuff you'll have. Do you have a third? Those I are do. I do. So efficiency is a really big thing. Uh, this is more so for people that are a little bit farther into their career, um, where you should know about how much it costs to create something, and you should know your uh, profit margins based off of that. And so where efficiency comes in is that paint tray that I just showed you. I can make multiple paintings from the same tray of paint, and all of that paint still won't dry out. I can remix certain spots and certain colors that I need to refill the palette so that I'm saving hundreds and hundreds of dollars because I use golden acrylics. So I can't really waste tons of paint every painting or else I'm losing profits with every ounce of paint that leaves the tube. So that knowing proper brush care, just having very efficient practices will actually raise your profits and you won't have to try and make more money or more sales. Yeah, I think that that's helpful for, I mean, there's definitely a lot of artists who have like figured this out for themselves, but um, being able to think in terms of money and profit and all of that is, is not always the easiest thing to wrap your mind around when you're just trying to be creative. Right, a hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, well, cool. I am going to open it up to questions now. Uh, Daniel Escobar has a question. And I'm going to call on you, Daniel, so that you can... Oh, wait, I don't see him in this. 
that might have been a separate thing. Okay. Um, he asks, you are autodidactic. Do you, and if so, how use other disciplines to inform your painting? High achievers seem to have de developed uh, proficiency in other fields. Yeah. So oddly enough, like I love woodworking wow. um, and I'm a huge nerd. So math and sciences, like I could watch Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about black matter all day. You know, there's just, I cook a lot and I garden. Um, just being Jamaican or raised by Jamaicans, you have a green thumb. Um, so, you know, I grow all different things to be cooked in different tropical flowers. So just understanding plants and um, understanding cooking, understanding different chemistries behind uh, cooking and baking, understanding the chemistry behind color pigments and the different materials that are used in paintings and like all of these different overlaps, you start to see things that I guess are technically une unexplored. So I'm not the first to use like thermochromic pigments. Uh, you've seen it in those college cups, you pour cold water in, changes from blue to purple, right? Mm -hmm. But to take the pigments, to mold them down thin enough to be in paints, to mix them in the proper paint, try and get the right dispersions, and then to actually use it in a painting that you are afraid to ruin, and most likely you'll ruin a few of them getting the right um, balance. But there's, there's just so many things that um, goes into being, um, what is it experimental and like taking risks there's some things like finance that you have to assume the return will be greater than the, the effort put in you know sometimes you have to even just lie to yourself and say there's a chance this will make me a million dollars if i do it <laughs> some people just need that kind of um motivation to try but for me it's just like another day Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we talked about that, like, you have a design background and that you're pursuing all these different fields. Mm -hmm. You consider architecture. Right. Um, yeah, and, and like, even design now, uh, we were speaking about the Woldridge Elementary mural, mm -hmm. and I was doing it for Runberg Rising, a nonprofit that operates in the Runberg district, and they needed a logo, so I just made them a logo and sent it to them. Like, so we could put it on their mural and they could just use it for other forms. Because, you know, like I said, if you see the need and you can have a mutual benefit in your community, you know, you don't have to wait till they ask you to design something, especially 90% of the time, they don't know all the other skills you offer. All right, so just pulling out of yourself and using all your skills, finding more skills and just rolling that into one fun, creative artist, whatever that is for you. Um, that's, that's great advice. Okay, let's see. Um, so if anybody else has a question, if you can raise your hand. Daniel, was there anything additional that you wanted to say other than that question? Maybe not. Um, yeah, so if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll call on you and um, you can turn your audio on and ask your question. Let's see, Shay, are you on that? All right. <laughs> yeah, I'm on, I'm on it, but um, it says that Daniel doesn't have the most current version of Zoom, so I can't allow him to talk in this session. Okay, I'm sorry, Daniel, but I hope that we answered, or that uh, Ryan answered your question. Um, anybody else? Questions for Ryan? Oh, there we go. Felice. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for your talk. That's, it's super interesting to hear you, uh, all that you have to say. I appreciate um, it. You were talking about possibly doing an MFA program. If so, I was curious if there were particular programs you were looking towards, um, and if that possibly meant that you wanted to go into teaching in the future, like academic teaching. 
to yeah, come curious have, about long-term goals? Yeah, I have considered that. I have, um, well, specific schools, you know, SAC, um, Yale. There are a few places that I've considered, but I feel like it's kind of ever-changing as I like to make sure I look at the staff and see how that will um, accent what I already do and where I intend to go. Um, but one thing that has been important to me is trying to get color theory back into higher education. Um, I saw a lot of schools removing the higher tiers of color theory as I was leaving school. And it was mind blowing to me being in design and people weren't at all concerned with the weight and gravitas of color. So, so things like that, I could see myself in a color theory class for hours and hours talking endlessly about, you know, the idea that we all see color differently. The fact that so many people are colorblind and have different levels of color sensitivities, you know, it makes me question when they look at certain artworks, are they actually able to feel the same emotional, um, physiological reactions ingrained within us that are tied to just the, the neural sensors of seeing a color versus someone that can't even experience that. So they're getting a different message from the art just based on their own receptors. It's like trying to understand all of that as you're creating art. Um, you know, that's something I'm very certain very few people even bring up. Um, so yeah, it's, that's, I do plan on reconsidering and maybe I will teach one day. I appreciate the question. It seems like you'd be a good influence on the upcoming students. So I would encourage yeah. you to, <laughs> as an art professor myself, I'd encourage you to go for it. I appreciate very, it. Very rewarding. That's good to hear. Thank you for the, the sentiment. Elise, you teach at Texas State, is that right? Yeah, I think that's. She went away. Okay, Daniel, I think is ready now. Awesome. Oh my goodness, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Holy moly. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, oh, um, I asked the question thing. I guess I have an alias and you guys found it out. Uh, I think I saw your artwork at Creative Action. Did you have a thing mm -hmm. there? Yeah, Last East, 2019. That's right, that's right. Um, <laughs> Man, I feel like I have a million questions, but uh, none of them are bubbling up to the surface. But I, I was really interested in the uh, autodidactic um, explanation um, because I like to have different disciplines uh, inform others or just like varied interests. Yeah. It's like, well, I can't help but like draw a correlation between, um, you know, uh, you, um, the relationship between like structure and like classical music maybe mm -hmm. and jazz and mm -hmm. how they inform each other. And right. then applying that, now this is starting to turn into a declaration, not a question, but... Uh, you're all right, you're all right. Yeah, the way that, like... Well, how about this idea? Tell me what you think about this idea. How about, let's get, let's get real with it. <laughs> um, so the idea of, like, improv versus, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, executing something that you sort of know. Planned and, right. right. Planned ahead um, applies to, like, uh, exercising and, like, athletic performance. So it's, like... I, uh, a, 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 a famous fighter once said, uh, precision and timing beats speed and power, hmm. right? So I took that idea from fighting and then applied it to other disciplines. It's like, instead of uh, trying to hit the heavy back as hard as you can or as fast mm -hmm. as you can, hit it mm -hmm. literally on beat to a, a music that's playing. Interesting. Because then you have control of your muscles. But I think the same thing applies to painting. Yeah. And when I get in the groove of painting, there's a rhythm to it. Yeah, and I even yeah. make noises, right, to accentuate, right? So yeah. I feel like this is a good, This I feel like I hacked my process. So do you have any, um, like, any insight into something similar that might happen to you? Yeah, you know, and that's pretty interesting. Um, I think that relates to the idea, and correct me if I'm kind of off target here, but where they tell people to stay in one, like, vein of art or create one style, you know, I mm -hmm. kind of, push back and rebel against that in terms of you're missing out on so much understanding like to 
And I like your point of precision over power. Um, for me, I think the more exposure you get in different styles, the more exposure you have um, in different fields, that is going to be what inspires your next artwork. You know, and it is okay to just paint flowers some days. Like you're also an emotional being. Like you don't have to be connected to this rigorous structured um, calendar to be an artist. You know, sometimes you need to wash away the feelings and the, the thoughts of the day before. And so if you end up quote unquote wasting time or putting time towards something that is not your profession, that is more than okay. Sometimes that actually empowers you and informs what you're doing um, that much more. So yeah, I do think it's smart to break out of um, like a rigid sense of doing things, especially if you're trying to get new results. You know, you really want to break away. And I, I don't like that quote, um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. Like, I feel like that's bashing mental health because insanity is like operating without any conscious understanding of what you're doing. But what, what they're saying is habitual, like you're stuck in your habits and you don't know any other way to do what you're doing. And that is stupid. Not being able to, to branch out and really test the waters elsewhere. And one thing I learned is think of the absolute worst possibilities that can come from what you're doing. If they really are just trivial things, like you're gonna mess up this painting, it's, it's just a canvas. Like go ahead, mess it up. No one cared in the first place, throw it away after you mess up. And that starts to remove a lot of the pressure a lot of that weight, a lot of your concern that was a barrier to you even learning or taking 30 minutes to read something. Yeah. <laughs> I've begun to call it mistake surfing. Hmm. I like that. I call it artist paralysis. Oh, yeah. Does anybody else have a question? I think we have time for one more. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Felice. I appreciate the questions. Yeah, good questions, guys. Okay, well, I don't think that we have any other hands up. So if you want to have a final statement, Ryan, what to sum it up, what advice do you have or any final words for everyone here? Yeah, um, main thing, just find your point of happiness. You know, don't, don't try to do too much or be too much to impress others like in art or on social media. It's always, always better to seek out education and advice before trying to educate and advise. That's about it. That's relevant, good advice. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you so much, Ryan, for being here, for your time, for your wisdom. We really appreciate you. Appreciate y'all, thank you all for joining in. And uh, we hope to see you all next week. We're doing this every Thursday, 11 a.m. If you have any other questions, you can always reach me at ryanruncy.com or ryan.runcy at gmail. Um, business related, art related. Yeah, either way. Awesome. Well, everybody have a good day. Thank you. Well, take care.